disappointing. Now you know this. The the times for famous people in advance. It's actually pick me. Where a hard drive in the New York Times office just sitting there, right? But now, her last when when our email eight or nine seven um, it was this. Because I want correct. This is published by the woman. Not. And the screen stuff. <laughs> it, it's her. It's um, I'm email it. I, I actually sent an email to um uh border. That was a good one. Now it's like I so uh, so I'm sitting. Back. She didn't pass away. Um and it's second class for um actual picture this is not her. Um, okay this, this is the picture in uh, 1964 it's roughly a decade after the case was decided um when we think of you know famous <laughs> supreme court cases we very rarely think of the people involved in those cases and that's just a fact of life Usually when the justices write their opinions, they have a you know, fairly brief fact section. They only include the facts relevant to their decision. And I'll tell you what, in most cases in your book, the fact sections are edited down pretty short. So you didn't even see all the details. But behind every famous constitutional case is what I call a constitutional face. So There's an actual person who was involved. And I encourage you to read her obituary, which has not been written, uh, after, after class. And it tells a story where she went with her dad to the local uh, elementary school, Sumner Elementary School. And basically her lawyer said, we want you to go to this school, try to sign up for registration. They're going to turn you away, and you just leave on your own. Now, that's easy for me to explain to you as a lawyer, right? I'm telling you what's going on. You need to be injured to have a lawsuit. You get that. But imagine you're a six-year-old girl, five, however old she was, five or six years old, right? And, you know... You're walking with your dad to register for school. It's a big deal. And, you know, she says, I'm walking up the steps. You know, it's a huge building when you're a little kid. And imagine walking in some office trying to register for class, and they tell you to get lost. And just, just put you in your head in the mind just for a five-year-old girl who has no idea what the Supreme Court is, right? No idea what, what uh, Dred Scott or Plessy ever. She doesn't know any of this stuff. And now think of her 10 years later, 20 years later away and people but are important and there's a reason why in every lecture I give you I always put pictures of the people I want you to understand they are actual beings affected by these decisions abstract test yeah, they were test cases, right but there, there are human beings who are being uh, uh, told to this school or that school all right so uh, go read the obituary I can't believe this correction I I, I wish shocked us out this morning um, they, they actually had another Bell's Norman McCorby, Jane Roe, Roe v. Wade. She died last year. She lived, was it in Sugarland or Pearland, somewhere in the Houston area. She actually died. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. She actually went to my church. No way. You know her? Uh, no, I didn't know her, but she Wow. <laughs> Did you ever talk to her? Um, no, we were in half at the same time. Well, there you go. <laughs>
Um, but but she passed away, and they made some errors in her obituary also, and they were corrected quickly about uh, an opinion that was anyway. So these obituaries have to be uh, fact checked, right? No fake news in this class. All right. <laughs> Uh, any other questions about? We'll do we'll do the Brown case in detail, Jonathan. I, I promise I'll get your question. I, I will I will discuss it. All right, let's do a poll question. Now we're ten minutes into class, but we're we're um, we're we're far enough along that I think we can answer a question. So the question for you is this, right? Um, after Brown versus the Board of Education, Plessy versus Ferguson was not. The supreme law of the land, true or false? Okay, another 10 seconds or so. All right. Uh, I don't know where I was. Oh. Are you? Yeah. Were you? Were you raising your hand? Were you next? Dude, your entire row's going to kill you. you know? <laughs> it's not just you. <laughs> okay. What do you think? Um, I put it. Okay, now, let, let's walk through this one step at a time, right? When I say the supreme law of the land, what am I referring to? Well, I would assume the Constitution. I mean, in referring to what the supreme law Where does this phrase, supreme law of the land, come from? The, the supreme law. Yeah, I heard that. Well, yes, I was thinking the scientific number. Okay, six. good. So, yeah, good, six. Yeah, article six, very good. Thank you. So we have this clause, right? Article six, the supremacy clause. And let me read it to you. It's a very important provision, uh, uh, probably the most important clause of the entire Constitution, not the most important clause. It says, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall have been made, under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. We've read this a number of times. So, so I'm going to ask you the question. What is the supreme law of the land? Constitution. The Constitution and? Um, and the laws of the United States. And? And all treaties. Good. Very good. Yeah. So the, so the supreme, I'm sorry, Article 6 spells out what is the supreme law of the land. And it lists a few things. It says first the Constitution, second it lists the laws, Third, list the treaties. And that says, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. What does that mean? The supreme law is above any state <coughs> law to the contrary. So, easy example, right? Constitution says you cannot impair contracts. The state enacts a law that impairs contracts. Aha! The state law gives way to the federal law. Easy. So there's no question that the, stat, the Constitution, also federal laws and treaties, are supreme over state laws. No doubt about that whatsoever. But my question for you is a little bit different. Uh, Hannah, you next, or is Donnie next? Yeah, my question to you is different. I didn't ask you whether the 14th Amendment was the supreme law of the land. I didn't ask you if the Equal Protection Clause was the supreme law of the land. My question for you was Plessy versus Ferguson, right? My question was Plessy versus Ferguson. Was that the supreme law of the land? So, Hannah, how do you go about answering that question? Well, I guess you need to look at the supremacy clause and look at each individual category. Okay, good. So let's go back down to our um, supremacy clause. Are decisions of the Supreme Court, according to Article Six? Supreme law of the land. The case law is the laws of the United States 
Second of all, laws of the United States refers to statutes of Congress. That's right. So are the decisions of the Supreme Court the supreme law of the land? Okay, so Derek, I see you shaking your head. What's this business of the judges in every state shall be bound thereby? What, what, what does that mean? Well, what are the judges in every state bound by? Or? Thank you. Right. So the judges in every state are bound by the Constitution and the federal laws and various treaties. Derek, are they bound by the Supreme Court's decisions? At least according to the text. OK, and I, I, I see you're uncomfortable with that. What I'm doing right now is making you very uncomfortable. It's like, wait a minute. Where does the Supreme Court fit in? It's called the Supreme Court. Does that make its decisions the supreme law of the land? Most law students, indeed probably most law professors, simply assume that the Supreme Court's decisions are the supreme law of the land. They say, aha, Josh Marbury, right? Chief Justice Marshall in 1803 laid it down and said, it's emphatically the duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Therefore, the decisions of the Supreme Court are the supreme law of the land. Chase, is that, did Marshall say that? Is that was, it, was that Marbury's holding? That the decisions of the court are the supreme law of the land? Well, where did he say that? You'll need to go to France and check your Marbury notes. Okay. But what was the holding of Marbury? Uh, he found that the. I'm drawing a blank. Um, it's okay. Sorry. Uh, he found that. Chase, let me ask the question. It, it, sorry, sorry, I'm just drawing it. That's okay. Off. What was the basic issue in Marbury? Right, what was the basic issue there? Um, it was whether or not the, he could get his uh, commission. Very good, very good. Did Marshall purport to establish a rule whereby the Supreme Court and only the Supreme Court could interpret the Constitution? Yes, sir. No, well, that's not right, Jake. No. Okay, tell me why. Um, what was the extent of Marshall's holding in Marbury? The Supreme Court has a constitutional authority to uh, review executive. Yes. Authority. Stated well, Jake. Thank you. Marbury established the rule that the courts can review the constitutionality of federal legislation. Right? But you may recall. How did this case arise? President Jefferson said, I'm not going to give Marbury his commission. Right? President Jefferson said, I'm not going to give Marbury his commission. Marbury said, aha, the Constitution requires you to do so. So we had a conflict, right? President Jefferson interpreted the Constitution one way. Marbury interpreted it another way. And then John Marshall interpreted it a third way. Right? Marshall, in his opinion, though, did not hold that only the courts can interpret the Constitution. He said that all the departments of government have that responsibility, the executive and the legislative branch. Right? Every member of US government takes an oath to the Constitution. And in their day-to-day -day duties, they're called upon to interpret the Constitution. Very few cases go to the courts. Even fewer cases go to the Supreme Court. So all branches of government can interpret the Constitution, right? But if we were to say that the Supreme Court can establish the supreme law of the land, that means that no one has any independence to interpret the Constitution, right? It also creates a very strange proposition. Um, Ryan, what's the only way to change the supreme law of the land, the Constitution? Amendment. Amendment. What if a decision of the Supreme Court is the supreme law of the land? What does that mean? Can you overturn a Supreme Court decision absent an amendment? Mm. So that creates a problem, right? If we say 
that decisions of the Supreme Court are the supreme law of the land. And we know the only way to change the supreme law of the land is through an amendment. How can the court ever return it, overturn itself? Yet we've seen the court do exactly this. I'll give you an example. The legal tender cases, right? In the span of what, two years, the court held first that the Legal Tender Act was unconstitutional, and then after a couple new members joined the court, they said, aha, now it's constitutional. Was this the supreme law of the land that changed so rapidly? Could that be? We've seen other cases, a switch in time that saved nine of the West Coast Hotel V. Parish, right? A 5-4 case going one way becomes a 5-4 case going the other way. So at least until 1958, the court never held that its decisions were the supreme law of the land. And indeed, we'll discuss this in a minute, Brown didn't actually overturn Plessy. There's another common myth. It did in a very limited sense, but didn't overturn it in its entirety. Nor did Brown order that Sumner Elementary School must be desegregated immediately. This is an actual picture of Lindy Brown, by the way. It's what she actually looks like, not a fake picture. But in our casebook, I can't tell me hours I spent verifying photographs because there are a lot of fake photographs floating on the internet. For example, there's no picture from her Plessy. If you Google him, you'll find it's not him. Like, I, I don't know where this picture came from. It's not him. It's, it's someone else. I don't know who it is. But this is actually Linda Brown looks like. This is a picture of her and her family. Okay. Anyway. Um, but the court in Brown didn't even attempt to desegregate. One second there. I promise. Didn't even attempt to desegregate Sumner Elementary right away. They said desegregate with all deliberate speed. So it's a very uncomfortable point I'm making. Right? And I'm fully cognizant of this. If you accept what I'm arguing here, that really diminishes the Supreme Court's power. And you might like the Supreme Court's power. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. With desegregation otherwise. But the flip side, I want, I want you to appreciate today is, the Supreme Court only has power when people are willing to accept it. If you look at the Cooper v. Aaron decision, right? If, if the Supreme Court issues a ruling and no one really cares about it, they just shut down their school districts, what, shrug emoticon, right? Well, uh, what then? So unless the president sends some federal troops to escort kids into school, the court's decisions are limited. So it's one thing for the Supreme Court to say its decisions are the supreme law of the land. It's a very, very, very different thing to actually make it so. Okay, Derek, patiently waiting. Well, they said it themselves. I don't know if they. Ever, I don't think they are to this day, but that's when they declared it. You know, it's like um, it's like letting a child set his own curfew, right? They'll make their curfew as late as possible. When the Supreme Court gets to define its own powers, there's not much limits, right? Like, would you let you know your little brothers just say, "Okay, when, when's your curfew? Midnight. Good. Okay, you know, never, never, no curfew." So, I don't think it's true to this day, but the court did declare this principle, so we have to at least go by what the courts say. Okay. Any questions on this? All right, so let's go over the facts of Brown. Um, and I, I have, again, lots of pictures. I spent a lot of time finding pictures. That's why I'm really annoyed at the New York Times, that they couldn't spend like five minutes verifying that the person is who says she is. Anyway, it's not hard. There are lots of pictures of her on the, on the internet. Anyway, so this is Linda Brown. Um, she was in third grade. What was it eight or nine years old? Maybe I, I, I said she was six. So about eight or nine years old, I'm guessing, when this happened. But look, the obit didn't know her age. They said she was 75 or 76. They couldn't even get her age right. They don't even know. Anyway, I'm, I'm, you can tell I'm annoyed. Uh, New York Times paper of record. They can't get her age straight. She has an age. It's either 75 or 75. It can't be both. No Schrodinger's birthday, right? So um, this is Linda Brown. She tried to enroll in elementary when she was in third grade. Uh, there was a, a white-only elementary uh, fairly close to her. The segregated school was a fairly big distance, so she'd have to travel a bit more. So here she is with her father and her mother. Uh, he, these are some great pictures. I couldn't get this one in the casebook. The copyright wasn't amenable. But, by the way, these pictures aren't free. The reason why they're in your casebook is they actually decrease my royalties, but I'm willing to pay it because I think these pictures are important. I couldn't get the copyright for this picture for the book, but you'll, you'll see it here. Um, it's a photo of each of the students 
um, with their parents. Uh, so uh, Vic, uh, Linda Brown is here, and then her father, I think, is one right behind her. Okay, um, And here's another uh, picture. This one, I think, is in your book. I got, we got this one in. Uh, all the plaintiffs lined up one after the other. I think Brown is uh, right there in the middle. Now, when you look at this picture, right, this was photographed in either Time or Life magazine, I'm blanking, but it was a very um, popular publication. And there was a very deliberate strategy to bring these adorable kids, and they're all very cute, right, to show people this is not going to be so bad if they're in your school, right? Um, when you have this sort of civil rights litigation, it's multi-part, right? It's part law, part political process, and part popular opinion. And the um, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who is responsible for litigating these cases, were very cognizant of the um, social issues at hand, that you had to persuade people um, that allowing these cute kids into your school won't be a bad thing. And this was an important point. Um, the NAACP had a very deliberate strategy, starting in like the 1930s, 1940s. Um, they recognized that chipping away at Plessy would not happen all at once. Instead, they adopted a fairly um, deliberate and methodical strategy. And at first they said, we're not going to overturn Plessy. Let's simply make the government live up to it. That is, the test says you can't have separate but equal. All right. Are the schools actually equal? And they would challenge a number of higher education institutions, mostly graduate schools, and they would say, look, these facilities are not even equal. So a very famous example in our own backyard involving Texas Southern University Law School. You know the story? Do you know it? So for many years, the law school at the University of Texas at Austin was segregated. Right? If you were an African-American student, you just couldn't attend. They wouldn't let you in. So litigation began. So what did the Texas legislature do? Did they desegregate UT? No, no, they didn't. They said, aha, we'll establish a separate law school, an African-American law school in Houston, which became today is now the Thurgood Marshall Law School at TSU, not even a couple miles from here. And a lawsuit was filed saying, no, 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 these law schools are not, I'm sorry, these institutions are not equal, right? That there are more resources at UT. Uh, <laughs> Better professors, right? better facilities, et cetera, et cetera. And the Supreme Court agreed. They said, aha, we're not overturning Plessy. We're simply saying these facilities are not equal. Give more funding. But this was only the, um, the initial round of this sort of litigation. The ultimate goal was not just graduate education, but primary, K through 12. And the lawsuits began with the Brown case. Now, even though Linda Brown is the only one who probably will get an obituary, they probably all should, uh, there were lots of different plaintiffs. There was uh, see, Vicki Henderson, Donald Henderson, Linda Brown, James Emanuel, Nancy Todd, and Catherine Carper. And also, do I have Bowling's picture? I think I do. Uh, he comes later, yeah. And as well, uh, uh, this is uh, Spots, uh, Spots with Bowling who lived in the District of Columbia, right? Um, these were the plaintiffs. And the NAACP chose schools throughout the country, not just in the North, but also the South, right? They had schools in Delaware. They had schools in DC. They had schools in Kansas. They had schools in Virginia, right? They tried to get geographic diversity. They went in. Delaware had segregated schools? Yeah, it did. Uh, Delaware had them pretty late on to the 1950s. So, all these cases were consolidated in a single cause of action. So even though the case is called Brown, it's not just Brown. It's Brown and Henderson and, and, and Carper and all these various other people. Um, why was Brown listed first? Um, as best as I can tell, they picked the name of the appeal that was filed first, right? The first appeal filed. I think Brown filed first. This was probably deliberate. Uh, the name was helpful people to remember it, uh, uh, unfortunately. Um, one, one gripe, the Obergefell decision, the same-sex marriage decision, there was actually a plaintiff, her name was either Love or Loves, I can't remember, but they had made it called Loves versus Hodges, a much better case name. 
people remember it, called apta names, right? They're appropriate names. They help you remember the name of the case. But anyway, we have Brown Report Education, all right? Um, I think, okay. Derek, you know I call you. Jonathan, uh, you next? Oh, you, oh, here. You asked me this question. This is perfect. So Jonathan asked a question a few minutes ago, right? Why was the case re-argued? So let me walk you through the chronology here. When Brown was first argued, the court was under the leadership of Chief Justice Vincent. Um, you've probably not heard of him. I think he wrote a dissent in uh, Youngstown. I think he wrote an opinion in Korematsu also wrote the dissent. Or maybe he was in the majority. No, he would have been. He wrote a dissent in Youngstown. That might be the only opinion you have of Vincent, if I can think of. Um, he wasn't particularly distinguished. Whatever. He died. He died very suddenly, had a heart attack. And he died shortly before the term began. So Brown was initially argued with Vincent at the helm. And the court couldn't come to a unanimous agreement. There might have been some dissents. Over the summer after Justice Vincent passed away, President Eisenhower made probably the most significant decision of his presidency, one he would live to regret. He appointed Earl Warren to be the Chief Justice. Earl Warren was the Republican governor of California. Uh, people forget that he actually presided over the internment of Japanese citizens. People forget that part. It happened, right? He, he made amends with it. Um, Earl Warren was also a politician. He'd never been a judge before. Earl Warren also was a possible runner for the Republican primary. They wanted to get him out of the politics and put him into the Supreme Court. Big mistake. Um, Warren would preside over what's called the Warren Court, which led to an expansion of uh, the Supreme Court's authority in race with respect to individual rights, the due process clause, the court really expanded its role under Warren. So uh, years later, Eisenhower would say this is the worst damn full mistake ever made. He's probably right uh, in hindsight. But he appointed Chief Justice Warren as a recess appointment. What's a recess appointment? The guy wasn't even confirmed right away. He was eventually confirmed, but while the uh, Senate was in summer break, they put on Earl Warren to the court. Think back to Noel Canning. Was that even a valid appointment? I don't think so, but we'll leave that aside for now. <clears throat> After Warren joined the court, he ordered it to be re-argued. And it made sense it was a new Chief Justice. But Warren had a very specific mission. He wanted a unanimous decision that all of the judges could agree to. Why? If there was a dissent, people would think, man, this is not really good, because it's, you know, 5-4 today, appoints another segregation of justice, 5-4 tomorrow, right? So Warren was intent on making this decision unanimous. But there's a cost, the second Cameron, there's a cost of making a decision unanimous. Right? Just think of your own friends, right? Let's say you have nine friends, and you want to pick a restaurant to go to or a movie to go to, right? You want to, you want to watch one movie. People are shaking out. It's impossible, right? Getting nine friends to agree on anything is impossible. Picking a vacation destination, right? It's impossible. So eventually, instead of doing something really awesome, you probably end up doing something really crappy that everyone can agree to, right? So something very boring, but everyone can go along with it. That's basically what happened in Brown, right? He wanted to make it unanimous. So he wrote the most narrow, bland, non-controversial opinion he could, and he carefully guided everyone so no one would fracture off. There were draft dissents that were never published. But the consequence is the decision in Brown is, I often describe as underwhelming, right? It doesn't have the oomph that you were probably expecting, like, oh my God, look, they're returning, plus this is awesome. Equality nationwide. No, it's really narrow. And they cite like social science. So it's a very strange opinion but you have to understand the context in which it arose that Earl Warren wanted to keep this unanimous. Cameron, patiently waiting. Do we know if before he was appointed, like Eisenhower and him got together on a game plan as to how they were no. working or something? No, no, and I've looked into this. Eisenhower probably wanted to get rid of him so he wouldn't run against him in the primary, uh, <laughs> throw him in the Supreme Court. Um, yeah, again, Eisenhower would say this is one of the damn biggest mistakes he ever made in his life. And again, this is the supreme allied commander of World War II. This guy was a general, and he could not stand, uh, he could not stand um, Warren uh, in many cases. 
Uh, uh, Denny and then Clinton? Uh, just why did you credit specifically? Um, so Eisenhower has a very, um, how do I put this? I can't. Uh, has a very mixed record on race. Um, he didn't agree with Brown. Okay. Uh, he didn't favor school segregation, desegregation. Um, he, as we'll do in Cooper, he did send troops in. But it wasn't because of the Supreme Court, it was because they were ignoring these, these lower court orders. But he never said he agreed with Brown. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a book out um, uh, about Earl Warren and um, Eisenhower. And apparently, while Brown was pending, Eisenhower told Warren, and this has been reported, at some coffee, you know, coffee or tea party, uh, you know, these parents in the South aren't bad. They just don't want their kids going to with black people. And he said this. And he used actually much more colorful language than I used, and I'll leave it there. Um, so he didn't agree with these cases. Uh, and he regretted the appointment. Yeah. Oh, Clinton, your hand was up. I'm sorry. So I, had, I had two questions, and somebody won't take it. How you said Gold Canny would. Noel Canning. I, I meant the Scalia dissent, the Scalia concurring opinion. Okay. So we, this would have still yeah, it's fine. reached that, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then my second question, how did you become Chief Justice? I thought you had to no. work your way up. You no. be appointed Chief Justice? John Roberts was appointed to be Chief Justice. Okay. Well, actually, Roberts was initially appointed to be an Associate Justice. Then after uh, Rehnquist died, Bush changed it to be appointed directly to Chief Justice. There's no requirement to start off as Associate Justice. John Marshall was appointed right to be Chief Justice back in the that day. That was a long time ago. I mean, yeah, there's no requirement. Okay. Uh, Rehnquist was elevated from associate to chief, but John Roberts went right to the chief slot. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyway, so Jonathan, you want to give us the facts, please, in Brown? Um, uh, so <laughs> you'll, you'll be fine. The issue in question was whether or not they should desegregate the specific school after they've already done a whole bunch of litigation, like you said, about the law schools. And um, they basically contended that it violated their 14th Amendment right, and that white schools were given better privilege than black, and that it was actually interfering with black people's development of their social skills. And in the end, they held that they were going to desegregate the schools. Very good. Very good. OK. Everyone with me? All right. So thank, thank you, Jonathan. So what I want to do here is explain what Brown did and did not do. We all studied last week, I think, it was Plessy. And Plessy appealed to segregated train cars, and they said so long as the accommodations are separate, I'm sorry, so long as the accommodations are equal, they can be separated. Okay? Brown does not disturb that holding in its entirety. What it does is it focuses on a very specific aspect of it, which is public school education. Okay. The court explains that in the context of public school education, separate schools cannot provide equal protection of the laws. Okay? That's the holding. Why? Right? Okay, I'll pass you. Um, is that Nick? Nick? Why does the court hold that separate schools cannot be consistent with the 14th Amendment? Why? Why? They don't hold that separate facilities are always unequal. They don't hold that. But in the context of education, why is this unconstitutional? Why? What evidence does the court rely on here? What evidence does the court rely on? No, Cooper haven't decided yet. What evidence does the court rely on in Brown? Carlos? Um, I would say that would be a different question, but uh, 
Okay, very good. So I wonder what Carlos said, right? The first question the court considers is one of history. And they frame the question in different manners, right? They say, at the time the 14th Amendment was ratified, was it understood? Was it contemplated? These different phrases. That this new provision of the Constitution would require the desegregation <coughs> of schools. Danielle, what was the answer to that question? Okay, Brian, what was the answer to that question? At the time the 14th Amendment was ratified, was it contemplated, was it understood that that amendment would prohibit the segregation of schools? What does the court say? You read the case? This is a very important question. You should know this. Stacy. Inconclusive. Very good. Why was it inconclusive? What sort of evidence they look at at the time of the framing of the 14th Amendment that's relevant here, Stacey? The words. The, the what? The post-war. The post-war amendment. That's right. It was an act after the war. But what sort of evidence do they look at to show whether the framers of the 14th Amendment contemplated who would require the integration of schools? Oh, um, the <coughs> I'm sorry? Regina? Um, I know they mentioned, I guess, the, the argument they had about um, the different versions of where they were. Uh huh. So, are you saying that there was little history on whether it had any Regina, is there any evidence that the, that the Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment had views on segregated schools that they cite? No, JC? There's a very specific piece of evidence. I'll come back to you. See anyone? Um, yeah, yeah, Alan. Is this a doll test? No, no, not the doll test. Abdul? So at that time, uh, whites were mostly in private schools. Like what did the Congress? There, Hannah? Well, wasn't it that there wasn't compulsory education in the Constitution? Um, because the. No. Danny? From my understanding, that it wasn't really developed. Like they talked about the what about the schools in the District of Columbia? Oh. Anyone? Whit? The court says the status of public education at the time um, was a big factor in why it was inconclusive. Is this not in your case with the District of Columbia schools at the time? This has been your case. But the status of public Yes. <laughs> At the time the 14th Amendment was ratified, schools in the District of Columbia were segregated. Yes, that was in the reading. It was in there. At the time the 14th Amendment was ratified, Schools in the District of Columbia were segregated. You see? Yeah, it was in Bowling. Yeah, it was in your reading for today. Okay. Yeah. So, JC, why is that fact relevant? Because 
because it shows it happened where the law was made and it's like yes. they didn't have a problem with the Yeah. These cases are read all together. That's why they're all signed, okay? At the time the framers, the 14th Amendment, ratified that provision, within the District of Columbia, where schools were segregated, Congress controlled the very schools in D.C., and they segregated it. This is why Chief Justice Warren says the evidence is inconclusive. Okay? Now, actually, he was being charitable, right? The evidence he cited cuts against him. Now, um, his historical survey was not that thorough. In fact, there's actually a lot of contrary evidence that the 14th Amendment does support Brown. If you want to read about it, there's an excerpt by Michael McConnell, a professor uh, who was at Chicago and now is at Stanford, uh, wrote about this in response also. So there's actually a fairly credible argument that the 14th Amendment can be supported based on originals. But Warren dismisses this. Okay, so because uh, Denny, you want to go now? You can go, right? Because he can't rely on history. What then does Chief Justice Warren turn to? Well, he turns to like the Dahl test. Okay, tell me about the Dahl test. Well, the Dahl test is basically like a, like a social science experiment or whatever, wherein they have like students look at dolls between like an African American complexion or like a Caucasian complexion. Then they choose which one is more preferable, from my understanding. And then they would they, they would be choosing the one that is Caucasian, and then they, they inferred it to be that there was some type of um, bias or animus that's being instilled in the students. All right. So, Denny, let me ask you this question. Um, why is the Dahl test, which is a basically a, a, a journal article, relevant? To interpreting well, the Fourteenth Amendment. Let me finish my question. The Fourteenth Amendment. I can, I can answer. <laughs> you're, you're so eager. You didn't let me finish my question. Good. Answer it. I, I didn't hear the. Uh, I'm sorry. Why is it Dal? <laughs> why is it Dal test relevant to the Fourteenth Amendment inquiry? Um, because in the past, like with Plessy and everything else, they didn't have that understanding compared to like a modern. Oh, modern. Why is modern understandings relevant to interpreting an amendment that was ratified 80 years earlier? Well, I, I guess my, my understanding is that they couldn't have known at the time. They couldn't have they, known. But they could infer that there was a general intent because they talked about, um, I think it was actually the next case, they talked about like the, the, the most uh, adamant of the reframers wanted equal, uh, the equality of the races. Mm -hmm. And so... Given the modern context, the 1950s context, the understanding, they can look back at that and say that you know there was that intent there. Thereby, given modern means of understanding of the implications of segregation. Very good, policy. Warren. Warren, let me ask you this follow-up question: How should the court interpret the Constitution based on social science, if social science perhaps can, you know, change, and articles that were considered correct one year can be considered correct a different year? <laughs> you want me to, 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 to decide whether traditionalism is like the correct year? I'm asking you a question. You do whatever you want with it. Take it wherever you will. I don't well, I mean, uh, it, You're next. It's, you, it's, you're it's on the line. I mean, it's, it, it's just fine because it's a big question of the Supreme Court whether or not they should change the interpretation of the Constitution to go in line with the, like, the changes in society. You know? And I, I think that that uh, new studies about uh, you know more modern understanding of the way that America works as a society should inform the way that the document that's supposed to govern America in perpetuity is, uh, is, is, is interpreted. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it should be changed. So uh, is our name tag there? John. Sorry. John. So John, let, let me give you an actual example, right? Let's say there's social science, and there is, which says in some cases, Bless you. Classes should be allowed to have people of only a certain race in a class. UC Berkeley tried this. They have small group section with only African Americans in a section, and only perhaps white people in a section, only Hispanic people in a section. It's actually conducive to learning to let people with similar races to act alike and to learn together. And there's social science supporting this. It's, it's, it's actually helpful for learning. I, I, you know, whether you agree or not, 
how do you deal with social science, which does fluctuate quite significantly? You got to give me something. Let me give you another example. Let's say social science says that the way to achieve human prosperity is through forced sterilization. Social science. Or that women can't work more than 10 hours a day because their uteruses might fall out. Social science. Brandeis brief, right? See where I'm going with this. Can you err on whatever you err on whatever doesn't limit liberty or what doesn't? So you can accept science when it promotes liberty, but you reject it when it infringes on it? Is that your answer? Ava? Right, but then if we're doing this based on equal protection, why do we need social science? What I'm trying to drill you guys on is why is footnote 11, right? This, this, it's, it's, it's a footnote under the doll photograph, right? Footnote 11. Why is social science, Gabriel, relevant? Right? What, or, or to what extent should courts be considering social science when they're making constitutional rulings? So again, you might love footnote 11 in Brown, but you're probably not so hot on Buck v. Bell's use of social science. And you're probably not so good with Muller vs. Oregon and the Brandeis bracing that your women have less water in their blood, whatever it was. I can't remember the stupid thing, right? That women are inferior and they need to have more protection from the state, right? So, Gabriel, help me out here. And I'll, I'll, I'll go around after Gabriel. Help me out here. What do, what do we do with this? How is a court to use social science? And, and when I say social science, I mean basically articles, you know, surveys, studies, science. Hashtag, right? <laughs> Do you think the social science really mattered to the court here, Gabriel? Well, to act like they care. Oh, what is what an interesting way you phrase that. To act like they care. What do you mean by that? Just give me a little bit more. I'll let you go after this. He says something that piqued my attention. It Sorry. Shows a sympathetic side of the Supreme Court. Where, you know, they really, you know, I mean, they may or may not. It's not the same that they don't. But it's showing, you know, they really care about the future of you know, this. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll break out in a second. But let me. I want to focus on on Gabriel's last point. The court says. They mention Plessy only once at the very end, right? They mention a little bit, then they come to back at the end. They say, whatever may have been the extent of psychological knowledge at the time of Plessy versus Ferguson, this finding is amply supported by authority, modern authority, footnote 11. So the reason why Plessy is not being adhered to here is because of footnote 11. So I asked Gabriel this question. I, I don't think it was you know, a dictum or something. This was actually part of the damn holding. Right? It's because of footnote 11 in social science that we can't rely on Plessy any longer. That's a pretty remarkable holding. All right, I saw hands. I think McKinney and Laura, I think Jonathan is up as well. Uh, yes, sir. You're going to pass? All right, Laura. So doing the doll test, it kind of shows, um, because in this case, the issue was public education, so education in general. Doing the doll test showed, or like social science could be, um, you know, showed that it, it has a huge effect in um, like instilling inferiority within the children. Uh -huh. And that's kind of why um, the fort, I, I can see that I would tie into uh -huh. the 14th Amendment because they're, they do discuss in previous cases about like inferiority, that reminder. Um, Were those majority opinions or dissenting opinions discuss inferiority? Oh, you're right. Who's, who's so dissent? No, I, I, and you make a very good point. So why does the court just come out and say that Harlan was right? Like you said in the beginning, they want to be like as narrow as possible. Yeah, and I think Laura is, is right on point, right? The court does this little tap dance where they're basically hinting at Harlan's dissent, right? They're talking about inferiority of the races and superiority of the races. They're talking about uh, 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 se uh, separate not being equal, but they don't say it. And instead, they, they, they bury it all in this, this bizarre footnote 11, which um, I actually love the way they format the page with the doll picture in the footnote 11 right in the same spot. Page layouts matter. We don't think about this, but they actually do matter a lot for pedagogy. We think a lot about layouts. You have no idea how many 
hours I spent on spacing of this damn book, but it, it makes a difference. Actually, very annoying. Uh, Jonathan, is your hand up? No, it, it just felt like they used pers they used persuasion the, the same way Congress is using necessary power. They just kind of slapped it on the end of their judgment to give it more weight. So you think it gave it more weight? Well, yeah. I mean, I think Warren wanted to do this, and he would need to do something more than just his opinion to back it. Now, the flip side to that, though, is what if social science changes? And what if, you know, five years later, someone tries to repeat the doll test and get different results? By the way, by the way social science, just, just, just so you know, is not always gospel, because the test of social science is can it be repeated by someone else and get the same results? And it happens quite often that tests are reperformed and they get completely different results. So didn't you cherry pick this time? Of course he cherry-picked it. Well, right. He didn't cite any contrary authority either. I don't know if there was any, but he wouldn't have cited it anyway. Um, Hannah, then Cameron, then Denny? Um, I mean, there's actually quite the opposite. And it's, it's right, but this is, that this is actually going to be repeated in 2007 and Same? Same result? And the results were the same. So Good. the causation was not necessarily exactly what they thought it was. So I see this interesting that it's used to propel a case to the point. And, and, and in fact, you can't really determine causation just by... Oh, I see what you're saying. The results were the same, but the causation may have been different. Right, well, I mean, clearly different. Different circumstances. Okay, very good. Cameron and Denny? Um, one thing I was wondering, not fully knowing how the judges were writing their opinions, would the use of social science in there be because Warren was a politician or not? Well, he was a lawyer, but not a judge. Oh, okay. so, he, he was, he wasn't that unqualified. He was, he, he, uh, he, he was, a, he was an attorney. I don't know if he, uh, he practices. I think he was the attorney general for California. Google me on that. I think he was, uh, but he was, he was never a judge so, before. Danny, um, I mean, I guess I understood it as like the court just trying to save, like to save face. Instead of like completely saying like, oh, we were completely wrong in Plessy, you know, we have a good reason for now. You know, changing this so thereby we kind of retain our authority. Yeah, so they wanted to make a ruling that it wouldn't be attacked, right? All right. So everyone, I mean, that that's the holding of Brown. I mean, we can talk about it for an hour, but it was a fairly narrow opinion, and it only concerned a public education. And the part that I think shocks most students, right? So this is one picture I love. Um, by the way. I can't tell you how many pictures have a caption as Linda Brown sitting in the courthouse steps. I, it's not Linda Brown, okay? <laughs> this is why I get her, her name was Nikki Hunt, okay? She has a different name. I, can't, I see it all the time. Linda Brown in the courthouse steps. It's not her. In fact, I think an earlier edition of this case may have said that, but I corrected it, okay? You don't want to be too annoyed by this, right? But look at, look at the um, headline from 1954. It says, big letters, right? High court banned segregation in public schools. If you were a, um, you know, a mother of a child and Brown was decided and you pick up that newspaper, you don't read the opinion, you pick up the newspaper, wow, holy, it's awesome. My kid can go to school if she wants, right? Not quite. So at the very end of Brown, the court says, well, we've made our decision, but we need some more time, right? We need to hold re arguments again on the remedy. And they faced a couple of difficult decisions. Would the Supreme Court supervise by itself all of the desegregation? Would they issue a decree saying all schools nationwide, coast to coast, even those not in the four states at issue, everyone desegregate? Would they let the lower courts? take control and manage it. Okay, eventually they chose option number three. And that was the Brown number two decision, which most law school casebooks omit. Second edition, this one did as well. I, I put it in. Um, this was an important case because it explained how the court was actually going to implement this decision. And the most important phrase in Brown two is, here, I'll write it here. All deliberate speed. I, I'll get back to the poll question, I promise. I, I promise I'll get back to it. All deliberate speed, right? All deliberate speed.
What does that mean? It meant that these school districts in the South had to proceed in what we call good faith, right? Um, Colby, why couldn't the court simply order the schools to immediately integrate tomorrow? Do it right away. Because it, there, are only, there is only certain states involved in the ground of education. You, you're right, you're right. You're giving me the next answer for Cooper. But even within Kansas, right? Topeka, Kansas Board of Education. Why couldn't the, the court say, you know what, Topeka, guess what? Let Linda Brown come to your school tomorrow, wherever she wants, and be done with this. Why couldn't the court do that? Practically speaking, think, think you're not a lawyer, but just a practical human being, right? Well, it's just really hard for them to enforce that upon the states alone. And, they, and, and it's, just not, it's just not practical for them to enforce that across the United States. It's only the Supreme Court. They don't have the Well, you're, 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 you're giving good answers. I'm thinking of a much more realistic question, right? Well, let's say, you know, a school had an enrollment of, let's say, 500, make it easy. And suddenly you had another, you have 500 white kids. And then you have a position saying, aha, 500 African American kids, now go to school. What is the school problem there? Tell me. Well, logistics don't work out. Why? Teachers, supplies, desks, facilities. Yeah. So there are legitimate reasons why this cannot be done overnight. And just think of something simple like school buses, right? You have to create new routes for school buses to pick kids up in different neighborhoods, right? You have to perhaps expand facilities. Also, if a building can only hold 500 people, that means you have to take some of the white kids and send them to other schools. Oh, this would come out as busing. You would, we, I won't talk about it, but we'll get to maybe a little bit later, right? So there were significant logistical problems. Um, there were also political problems as well. So I think the court recognizes there might be some good faith reasons why, right, I'll continue in a second. There might be some good faith reasons why integration can't be done instantly. So the court set a standard, all deliberate speed, which means you can take some time, but there have to be good faith delays, and not because you're resisting the court's decision. Um, this is in your book somewhere. In the five years after Brown, according to NAACP estimates, the number of desegregated schools was pretty close to zero, right? In the years immediately following Brown, nothing changed. Uh, I, I think Linda Brown graduated and never even went because she got too old. She, by the time she, by the time the school integrated, she was already uh, uh, already past uh, uh, the grade level, fifth grade. Right. So, so Brian poses a very good question, right? Brian's like, by putting this sort of vague language, they allow the southern states to drag their feet and throw up all sorts of smoke screens. So Brian, let me give you another example. Let's say the court said, Topeka, Kansas must integrate their schools by September 1955, right? The following September, making up a date. September 55 rolls around, and Topeka's like, yeah, I'm sorry, we couldn't do it. We just couldn't do it. OK, we'll give you an extension of six months. Yeah, we still can't do it. Got to buy more school buses. Got to buy more tables. Okay, another six months. How would that look for the court of issuing extension after extension? Would anyone take the deadline seriously? No. So I think the answer, and again, I, I don't know the answer, is the court was content to just make the ruling and just sort of hands off. In fact, in the years following Cooper, I'm sorry, between Brown and Cooper, the court basically did nothing. Right? They didn't touch it. And in the years following Cooper... They basically did nothing either. They let everything go. School districts in Virginia, Prince was it Prince Edward County, it's in your book, shut down for an entire year, two years, three years. Supreme Court did nothing. So Brian, your question, I think, cuts to the heart of this issue. Had the court tried to micromanage this process and the state said, you know what, screw it, we're not going to do it, it would have weakened the court in an immeasurable way. That they were content to get this headline in the newspaper, right? 
with uh, Miss uh, uh, Nikki, right? He was like, aha, we're done. Peace, we're good, right? We put this headline in the newspaper. Everyone knows we did the right thing. And we'll let these other people sort of through difficult things. Only in Cooper do they come back to it a couple of years later. Abdul? Do you think another explanation also uh, the resistance would have been stronger? If it was precise deadlines? Example, like the governor of uh, was it Arkansas? Yeah. So it was like a really big show, like really embraced himself historically, but I mean, that, I mean, he's representing a good chunk of He got country. reelected during this. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a percentage of the country that was not on board. So, for them, like, to make it narrow and to make it flexible and so on. Yeah, they knew they were going to get resistance. resistance yeah, yeah. So, Abdul puts up a good point, right? The court expected resistance. I don't think they expected this, right? I don't think they expected billboards saying impeach Earl Warren right in the South. I don't think they expected death threats, right? I don't think they expected the president of the United States having to send federal troops to escort children to school. They did not expect this, right? Um, which shows that often the court doesn't quite understand the context of their decisions. They're often living in these sort of insular um, ivory towers, right? Where they don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, courts are very bad with these sort of things. Was there another hand? Oh, Clinton, go ahead. I'm trying to question my question a little bit. So aside from the Merriman case and these cases, has there been any other cases where people have just said, hey, we love what you do for us, Supreme Court, great idea, but we're not going to take advantage of that? You understand what I'm saying? I'll, get, I'll answer your question when we do Cooper in a few minutes, I promise. I'll get there. Yeah, Colby. So did this holding lead to like school districts in the especially in the South gerrymandering the district lines in order to keep the schools segregated? Yes. Yeah. Um, there 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 was a movement in the seventies, I don't have any cases on it, I don't have time called busing. And what this basically meant is you would bus white kids to disadvantaged schools and you would bus black kids to more prominent schools. This led in large part to what's called white flight, where basically white families would just leave neighborhoods and say, screw this, we're, we're leaving, we're moving somewhere else. And this went on for decades, decades. Um, in hindsight, the busing experiment didn't work out too well. And federal courts tried to manage this, it, it, it didn't work. Um, there are other approaches that may have worked better, but in, in hindsight, it was not successful. Uh, you're not going to believe this, but oh God, what was it? In the last year, was it Mississippi? It might be off in the city, I think it was Mississippi. There was still a school that was under a desegregation order in 2017. And just a year ago, it was dissolved. Was it Mississippi? Yeah, it's Google Land. I think it was Mississippi. But in the last year, 2017, there was still a school that was under a federal segregation order. So this process, which, you know, this headline is lovely, right? Uh, 50 years later, it was still ongoing. 60 years later. So any more questions on Brown? I'll do Bowling v. Sharp in a minute, but... Brown, again, it's an important case, um, but it doesn't give you what you want. There's actually more good stuff in bowling, which has problems, but bowling actually makes a contribution to constitutional law that Brown doesn't. Any other questions on Brown? Okay, all right. So let's do bowling v. Sharp. Uh, Trey, you next? Trey, what was the problem for the court in bowling versus Sharp? Okay. And why is that a problem, Trey? Uh, because yeah. So this is, this, this is a, uh, uh, an easy way to trip up people who aren't paying attention on the exam, right? If I ask you a question about the states, I'm asking about the 14th Amendment. If I'm asking you a question about the federal government, I'm asking you about the Fifth Amendment. Right, the 14th Amendment has any protection clause. No state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws, right? Fifth Amendment, though, lacks an equal protection clause. Why would it? It was enacted you know, 80 years earlier, in 1791. It has, though, a due process clause, which states that nor shall any person be deprived of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. OK. So Matt, 
how does the court get around the fact that the Fifth Amendment, which controls schools in D.C., federal schools, is not governed by the Equal Protection Clause? How do they get around this fact, Matt? Okay. And what do they do with due process? Oh, very good. They merge together. They merge together these concepts of due process and equal protection. Right? They say they both stem from an idea of fairness. They say the equal protection of the laws is a more explicit safeguard of unfairness than due process. Now, Scott, what have we talked about in the past of courts deciding whether the law is fair or not? What 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 cases or what, what line of cases we should talk about there? What have we been talking about the past couple of weeks? But the law is fair. Um, I mean, the word that comes to mind is, uh, is, is, it, is it arbitrary or not? Good. What cases have we discussed focus on that? You need to start thinking about cases. Be, I, be um, later in time? Later in time. What other cases? Kimmy? This is we covered about judges deciding law is not fair. I'll come back to you, Michelle. Yeah, and what other cases in that same line? Um, uh, optical, good. What clause of the Constitution are they relying on in those cases, Michelle? This is sort of an exam question we're posing. You need to know this. Sam, you go ahead, fish it. Um, I know they talk about scrutiny. What clause of the Constitution are they talking about? It's a very easy question. Due process, Due process clause of the which amendment? Very good. Okay. Lochner, right? Mueller versus Oregon. Buck v. Bell, Buchanan v. Worley, Williamson v. Lee Optical, right? Atkins v. Virginia. I'm sorry, Atkins v. D.C. Hospital. These were all cases where the judges decided under the due process clause, is this law fair? Is this law arbitrary? Right? Bowling v. Sharp isn't really an equal protection case. It's a substantive due process case. It's a case involving substantive due process. That one of the liberty interests involves fairness of the laws. This case is often called reverse incorporation, that the 14th Amendment is incorporated back into the 5th. That's one way of looking at it. I think the better way, and based on the cases they cite, is, is this law arbitrary? Does the state have a good reason to segregate, I'm sorry, does Congress have a good reason to segregate public schools? And Kimmy, what's the answer to that question? Does, it, does Congress have a legitimate reason to segregate public schools? That's right, why not? Yes. The court says this imposes an arbitrary deprivation of the liberty of these students in violation of the Due Process Clause. That the governor has no good reason. And if you notice, they cite Hirabayashi. They cite Korematsu. And those were cases also decided under the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause, which says when laws affect certain racial groups, courts look at them with heightened scrutiny. That when laws affect certain groups based on their race, 
use heightened scrutiny. Now, in, Korba, in Hirabayashi, in Korematsu, right, the, the Japanese people lost because there was a sufficient compelling interest to justify it. But here, is there a sufficient compelling interest to justify segregation? The court says no. So really, in my mind, bowling is a far more important opinion than Brown. Because it's relying on substantive due process, they cite Buchanan v. Worley, for the notion that we as judges can decide if laws are unfair. And since there's no good reason why this law exists, we're setting it aside. This was the basis for Loving versus Virginia, by the way, right? That there's no good reason to have a ban on interracial marriage. So Bowling v. Sharp and Loving versus Virginia, the due process analyses, those are very much along the same lines. Case used to reincorporate that into the 14th Amendment? Yes, sir. So that. Yeah, How it's because of this decision that Congress is now bound by the Equal Protection Clause. It's what's called reverse incorporation. It's a bizarre concept, right? We've discussed incorporation. We've, we've discussed incorporation where the 14th Amendment incorporates the provisions of the Bill of Rights. This is what's called reverse incorporation where the Fifth Amendment incorporates the Fourteenth Amendment. It makes no sense. It's gibberish. Right? It, 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 it's, it, it makes no sense. Think about this for a minute, though. Is it plausible that when Congress ratified the Fourteenth Amendment, they want to put the states under one standard and Congress under another? Absolutely. This was during Reconstruction. Congress didn't trust the states to do anything. It's entirely plausible that they wanted different standards for the states and federal government. That doesn't matter, though. The court has said rights are protected for the same for Congress and the states. There's no difference. I think it's wrong, but that's where we are. So this case should be used to argue for state rights as well. So let's say with the case of absence of federal law, so let's say Texas is discriminating against same-sex marriage, I can use this case to argue. But you, you can use the 14th Amendment standing on its own. Why do you need bowling? Bowling only matters when. No. You would only use bowling if the federal government's engaging in discrimination. That's where you use it. Okay. So the bottom line of bowling was that Congress could not segregate schools because they lacked a sufficient justification for that that deprived them of their liberty and violates the due process of law. Yeah, Brian. Is there an argument there? Or it's just unthinkable. The court makes no argument why that's the case. I don't think it's correct as a historical matter. But they, they say they, they just put that out there without any explanation. Well, doesn't, doesn't it sort of make sense that if you hold, if you hold a standard for no. state, like why wouldn't the federal government be held to? Because Congress trusted its. No, I'll give you the answer. Congress trusted itself more not to enact those certain laws. And they may not want to place stuff under that scrutiny. If Congress wants to impose a standard on itself, they can do that very easily. They didn't. I, it actually makes quite a bit of sense. Um, as Reconstruction was going on, you had segregated schools in D.C. It's entirely plausible they didn't trust the states to do something and they thought they could manage their own affairs. Yeah, again, the, you're right. The court says that, but they offer no argument why. They just say it. They just they offer with that explanation. Good. Any other questions on Bowling v. Sharp? All right, so between Brown 1, Brown 2, and don't get confused, Brown 1 and Brown 2, they're different cases. Brown 1 and Brown 2, and then Bowling v. Sharp. The court puts forward this standard that schools must desegregate with all deliberate speed. Um, didn't work out so good. Um, almost immediately after Brown was decided, southern states began to look very skeptically on Brown. And it wasn't just southerners. A lot of very prominent law professors, learned hand, I'm sure you've heard of, a judge, famous judge, destroyed Brown. They said it was a farce, right? If you want to go Google learned hand Brown, be bored. Read what he said. He said, the opinion has no legal justification. Let's even try. 
And the Southerners tried to develop a fairly um, sophisticated strategy to resist Brown. And this led to what was called the Southern Manifesto. The Southern Manifesto. Now, it's often said in books and articles and elsewhere that the Southern states were trying to ignore Brown. Um, I even said that in the past. It's not correct. Brown, as a decision, only concerned school districts from Kansas, Virginia, Delaware, South Carolina, and then, yeah, D.C. Other school districts were not party to the case. And you know this from CIFPRO, right? If you're not part of a case, there's no race judicata. You're not bound by a decision. And it makes good sense, right? If I wasn't able to challenge some judgment in court, how can I be bound by it? Now, suddenly, though, when it comes to the Supreme Court, you throw CIFRA out the window, right? Not exactly. The Supreme Court didn't even purport to bind parties beyond its decision. They said, we're controlling people in these four states. And we will remand it to the trial courts, the district courts, to integrate with all deliberate speed. So it's not the case that they were ignoring Brown. And in fact, the Southern Manifesto is a little bit more sophisticated. They said, unless you are personally bound by a court judgment, you should not follow it. So here's what happened, Laura. So this, they, I guess, adopted the Lincoln. Oh, that's my next question. So Laura, which president were they emulating here? Lincoln. Thank you. Very, see, someone's paying attention. Very good, right? Lincoln. The irony of ironies is that the Southern Manifesto took a playbook from Lincoln. Because what did Lincoln argue? Oh, raise your hand? Yeah. Those in the party, they Very good. So Dred Scott v. Sanford, right? Dred Scott was a slave. Sanford was the owner. Those are the only two parties in the case. The United States did not even file a brief in the case. So Lincoln said, wait a minute. We can respect Dred Scott between Mr. Scott and Mr. Sanford. That's it. But the United States was not a party to it. Therefore, we don't have to follow it. And I've actually done some research on this. Even after Dred Scott, Congress passed laws basically ignored it. Right? Congress passed laws regarding no slavery in the Northwest Territories, right? Even though Justice Taney said the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional, Congress ignored it. Then you had Stephen Douglas, who was Lincoln's opponent in the Senate race, who said, no, 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 the Supreme Court's final, we need to adhere to it. So you have this irony, right? You have these segregationists who are borrowing a playbook from Lincoln, and you have the Supreme Court borrowing the playbook from Stephen Douglas, who favored Dred Scott. Everyone see how everything's backwards and topsy-turvy, right? The Southerners were saying, unless I'm bound by a judgment, I won't follow. And this created what I call a constitutional game of whack-a-mole, right? Ever remember this from the carnival? Whack-a-mole, right? So it's this cartoon, it's this arcade game where you have these little hammers, right? And these little moles pop up. You hit one, it goes down, another one pops up. You've seen this, right? But the problem is they keep on one, one, and you can't get them all, and then you lose your tickets and you don't get the little pencil eraser, right, or the stupid prizes. <laughs> this is what happened in Little Rock, Arkansas. And this is not well understood. And, and I wrote an article about this, I want to read it, but it's not well understood at all. Most people don't get this. So in Arkansas, there was a judgment against the school board. And the court said, school board, you need to integrate. Then what happened? The governor of Arkansas sent out the state National Guard, to block children from entering the school. Was he ignoring Brown? He wasn't a party to Brown. Was he ignoring the district court order? He wasn't a party to the district court order. Okay, so then what happens? The district court issues another ish, uh, order saying, Governor and um, the National Guard, you can't stop kids from entering the school. So then what happens? The Little Rock police show up, and they deny children the ability to enter the school. Were they bound by the judgment? No, not yet. So this is what I call whack-a-mole, right? They were actually fairly sophisticated. I'm not trying to say they were, they, were, they were good people. Please, don't get me wrong, but they had lawyers advising them on how to go about this so they wouldn't be bound. Finally, though, Eisenhower, who, again, did not like Brown, I mentioned before he was not a fan, said, okay, this is too much. President Eisenhower sent in federal troops to Little Rock to escort what we're called the Little Rock Nine, nine African-American students into school. Um, has anyone ever been to Little Rock? Anyone ever go to, this, to visit the school? 
So what? So if you ever go to Little Rock, I encourage you to visit Central High School. This is the most iconic picture. Um, and again, these guys have guns drawn, right? Why they have guns drawn? Look at this picture. Um, this is a very iconic picture where the student is trying to enter a school and this woman is just yelling at her with, you know, with, with every ounce of hate you can even just imagine. There's actually a good footnote. Decades later, she apologized to her and made a public apology. Yeah, I mean, she, you know, was she, you know, 18 years old, 17, you know, she's whatever. Um, but she apologized some decades later. But just that picture is very famous because it's like, wow, look at that picture. But they needed armed escorts to take them into the building. And here's Governor Oval Faubus uh, with a headline, Guns Force Integration. That's how it was covered in the, uh, in the newspaper. Um, you can go visit Central High School. It's actually, uh, an, uh, uh, it's the only national park in the country that's a, that's a public high school, right? So I went there a couple years ago. I felt like a creep. Uh, <laughs> I, I felt like a freaking creep. It was really bad. Because school's in session, and I'm this schmuck walking around with my camera taking pictures. I was like, oh, God, this is, for my students, I'll do this. But um, if you ever go to Little Rock, it's about five blocks from the Capitol, and the school's humongous. It's a huge school. And this is why I really, I was walking up the steps. I was like, okay, I really feel like a creep now. But uh, for my students, I'll do it. But I, I, just walking up the steps and trying to put yourself in the mind frame happened decades, you know, these kids with these guns. When they finally made it into the school, um, they weren't allowed to go to class because they, they were afraid to be beaten up. So they kept them in the principal's office all day. Um, the semester went quickly enough, but eventually they, they had to stop going because it was very, very dangerous. Okay, that's the part people know about, right? What happened afterwards is very important. The school board came back to the district court and they said, we need an extension. Give us 30 months, which is basically two and a half years, right? We need basically three full academic years to get people ready for this integration. And they said, there's all this chaos and turmoil. We can't guarantee the safety of these students. I mean, we can't keep federal troops in our school every day. What happened next, though, changed, I think, history. The district court, who again was on the ground, said, all right, I'll give, tell you what. I'll give you 30 months, which is basically three years. I'll give you three years to get your act together, then come back. The NAACP appealed to the Court of Appeals of the Eighth Circuit. And the Eighth Circuit reversing, no, no, no. You don't get 30 months. That's not consistent with all deliberate speed, right? What does all deliberate speed mean? Whatever it means, it's not 30 months. Again, the, the, the problem with the court not giving a timeline, I think it was Jonathan asked me earlier, became apparent now, right? One year, two years, three years, right? They can keep dragging it on. Then the case gets appealed to the Supreme Court. The court does something very strange. They hear it in September. Or actually, well, first in August and again in September. The court's term doesn't begin until October, but they held what's called a special term for an emergency. Why are they moving so quickly? To ensure that the school would be integrated on the first day of class. That was their goal. Now, let me tell you what happens afterwards before you get to what happens in the case. The Arkansas legislature had passed a law while this case was germinating, which said all public schools will be handed over to private corporations. And as we know from the civil rights cases, private corporations are not subject to the 14th Amendment. So all along, everyone knew those schools were never opening up. Everyone knew this, right? There was no mystery. So the court knew its decision was going to be irrelevant, right? They, they, they knew this was coming, at least in the short term, it would be irrelevant. So after the court issued this decision, Governor Faubus signed the legislation and basically shut down the public schools. And for a period, I think about a year or two, if you were a high school student in Little Rock, you had nowhere to go. There were no schools for you. Throughout the country, school districts shut down rather than integrate. And their, their entire high school yearbooks that are just empty with classes are just missing. People just did not graduate in a given year. Um, this was a very deliberate effort. Rather than integrate the schools, they just shut down the schools. What some jurisdictions did was they said, okay, we'll give you uh, basically vouchers for private schools. And then you can go to a private school for that money. But we don't have a public school. Years and years went by before this situation changed. So 
The court, I think, recognized that decision was important perhaps in the long term, but not in the short term. So the case was initially argued August 28th, and then re-argued on September 11th. The day after September 12th, the issue was called a per curiam opinion. Per curiam means unsigned altogether. No one signed it. It was what, like a paragraph or two? And it said, schools must desegregate immediately. And we'll come back later with a longer decision, right? We'll, we'll, we'll give you something a little bit more later. And then a couple weeks later, they issued this decision, which was signed by all nine justices, which had never been done before. Um, I recently wrote a paper on this case where I went to the Library of Congress and I pulled all the papers from the justices from the, the drafts. I went through hundreds of these various draft opinions and various papers. This was a very collaborative process. And at times, it was a very antagonistic process. Um, at one point, Justice Harlan wrote in the margins of Brendan's draft opinion, quote, terrible, exclamation point. Can you imagine that, right? If you get a feedback from your legal writing professor, terrible. You, you start crying. This is from another justice, terrible, right? Um, but eventually, they got to the opinion they got to. And I want to study this carefully, because uh, uh, I think it's, 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 it's an important opinion that's, that's just not well understood. OK, so um, who am I up to? Samuel next? So you want to walk me through, Cooper? Yeah. Um, so first, the um, justices kind of condemn the state officials for trying to, to circumvent or nullify the rolling and brown. And they say that, um, yeah, brown can be uh, overruled or circumvented by evasive schemes uh, for segregation. And they say that uh, basically that Brown is the supreme law of the land. Uh, they get into um, the Article 6 analysis, and they cite Marbury saying that the duty to say what the judge have a duty to get the law is. And um, in that sense, the 14th Amendment is an interpretation or Brown is an interpretation of the 14th Amendment, and Brown is the supreme law of the land, and state officials take like an oath uh, to support the Constitution, and then they follow this to the law of Brown. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, I want to walk you through the court's analysis, because it's not very long. Um, the relevant passage begins on, was this page? Uh, 1022. Um, so the first part of the opinion um, isn't very controversial. I think probably everyone in this room can agree that a 30-month delay is not consistent with all deliberate speed. I think everyone would agree with that, right? Maybe a year, maybe two years, not three years. <laughs> okay. But why didn't the court stop there, right? Why didn't they just say, uh, we reverse, we find that the 30-year month delay it's not consistent, you have to integrate immediately. Why didn't they stop there? Because they wanted to address the claims of the governor and the legislature that there's no duty to obey federal court orders resting on the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution. Now again, Faubus was very careful not to disobey a federal court order, right? When he was enjoined sent at the police department, right? There was this whack-a-mole game. So they weren't only addressing this issue. They were addressing the status of Brown itself on people who were not parties to Brown. And they can get to this part, right? This paragraph is an important part. It says, what has been said in the light of the facts developed is enough to dispose of the case, right? In other words, we're done with our holding. Have some dicta, right? It's saying it like it doesn't even be that obvious, but we're done. Like we did our, we did what we had to do. Stuff that comes after this, not really holding, but you guys should pay attention, right? They say we should answer the premise of the actions of the governor and the legislature that they are not bound by our holding in the Brown case. And they say it is necessary only to recall some basic constitutional propositions, which are settled doctrine. 
So um, I'll humbly submit that the principles that come after this are not settled and they're not basic. Um, they basically made it up, right? They, they, they tried to make rules that maybe aren't wrong but are not supported by Marbury. So they say Article 6 makes the Constitution the supreme law of the land. The Constitution, not the court's decisions. Okay, so now you have Marshall and Marbury that said the Constitution is the fundamental apparent law of the nation and it's the province and duty of the court to say what the law is. That doesn't say the role is exclusive. And this next paragraph, which is probably the most important paragraph, oh, I'm sorry, the next sentence, which is probably the most important sentence in the entire case, is very significant. It says, this decision, Marbury, declared that the basic principle that the federal judiciary is supreme in the exposition of the law of the Constitution and that principles ever, ever since been respected by this country, by this court in this country, as a permanent and indispensable feature for a system. Okay. And the next sentence is where it really goes off. Okay. It follows. What does it mean it follows? Well, Brown didn't hold that, but it follows from Brown. This we call an inference. Right? You guys learn arguments, right? Brown didn't hold that. I'm sorry, Marbury didn't hold that, but it follows from Marbury. By the way, in the earlier drafts, that phrase it follows wasn't there. In the earlier draft, Brennan, who wrote the opinion, it was a draft, and just, here's what Marbury held. So they actually modified that. It follows that the interpretation of the 14th Amendment enunciated, enunciated, right, the reign in Spain, enunciated by this court in the Brown case is the supreme law of the land, and Article 6 of the Constitution makes it a binding effect on the states. Anything in the Constitution... Notwithstanding. This establishes what became known as judicial supremacy. It's a doctrine that became known as judicial supremacy, which is a notion that the Supreme Court's interpretations are the supreme law of the land, that there's no difference between one and the other. And I, I asked you earlier today uh, this question, let's see the results, right? After Brown v. Board, Plus, he was not the supreme law of the land. Uh, most of you said true, right? That it was not the supreme law of the land. Um, it's a hard question to answer because I don't think Plessy was ever the supreme law of the land. If Plessy was the supreme law of the land, you would need an amendment to overturn it. You never had that amendment. So my position is Plessy was never the supreme, uh, supreme law of the land. It was wrong the day it was decided. It was wrong in 1958. I was wrong in 1955. Yeah. Because I want to understand this point. So, well, one of the three categories from the uh, sixth, sixth uh, not clause, sixth, anyway. Um, okay, let me bring it up. Yeah. Clause, yeah. 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 So yeah. One of them says uh, the laws of the land. Yeah. Or something along the line. Yeah. yeah, yeah, here it is. So, that's that's basically saying like a bill that's passed through Congress. Yeah, the law of the land refers to Congress. Sure. Laws then, of the United States. But then, case law, what the Supreme Court other is not. I don't so think that, so. So that means those, those branches aren't equal. Because isn't that the equivalent, like a, a bill in a case? Well, Abdul, I mean, you raise a good point. Does laws of the United States refer to case law? I don't think anyone has ever raised that argument before. I don't think it's implausible, but it, 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 there's not much grounding there. But, but I'm saying, so is it fair then to, to, from that fact, can we then say the legislator is a level above the Supreme Court? The legislature has a role in creating supreme law. The court does not. Yeah, right? Because, look, the judges are bound by those laws. Yeah. Not that you get to set what those laws are. And not those zero. Hmm. I said no, because didn't, didn't Brown only refer to like, segregation in school? And it took about yeah. two decades to get rid yeah. of all of the Jim Crow? Yeah, yeah. I think the answer is false no matter what. Right? I, no matter how, how you re read the answer, um, Plessy was not overturned by Brown. And I don't think it was, away, yeah, and I don't think it was ever the Supreme Law of the Land to begin with. Brian? Interpreting it for themselves, they're interpreting the issue as it's based on the Constitution. So they're, they're, they're 
decision just isn't based off of nothing. It's based off of how they're interpreting the Constitution at that time for that particular issue. What would Abraham Lincoln say in response to that? Right, so this was not universally agreed upon. Some people agreed on it, some didn't. And until you came to Cooper, the court never stated this. There was a robust debate with Lincoln, with Andrew Jackson, with Thomas Jefferson, that various branches of the government can interpret the Constitution for themselves. Cooper purported to settle it, right? Cooper said, we decide for everyone. But in the aftermath of Cooper, did anyone pay attention to it? Not... Arkansas, they shut down their schools. Right, so Brian, what you're saying is what most people think, right? Most people think the Constitution gives the Supreme Court the power to interpret the Constitution with finality. That's not written in the Constitution, and it wasn't written till Cooper. People like Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Jackson, Thomas Jefferson, and others vigorously disagree with that. And if you accept Cooper v. Aaron, then you would have had to accept Dred Scott, Right? If you accept that Cooper v. Aaron is correct, then Lincoln's opposition to Dred Scott was not permissible. You can do both. I mean, there's no, nothing wrong with it. Stephen Douglas said, I hate Dred Scott, but I'm going to follow it. And if you take that position, then Plessy should have still been good law, and challenges should just been rejected to it. So what I'm giving you is a very, I know, it makes you feel uncomfortable, right? Because it puts you on all sides of all issues. But if Lincoln is right, to resist Dred Scott, then this other manifesto can also be right. It's bizarre, right? Bizarre. Uh, Clinton, was your hand up? Yeah. So Cooper uh, establishes the judicial supremacy, and the way I understand that is once the Supreme Court issues an opinion that is considered supreme in constitutional basis, I think, of the, the courts going down, but does that limit the capability of the legislative branch or the executive branch? So here's the important point. I'm glad Clinton phrased it that way. By saying the Supreme Court is supreme in its interpretation of the Constitution, that means other branches can't disagree. They can't. Cannot. They cannot disagree. Jefferson, Jackson, Lincoln did not think the Supreme Court was final and that the people could have a different... Give me an example. Thomas Jefferson thought that the Alien and Sedition Acts were unconstitutional, right? These limited political speech. He refused to enforce it and gave pardons to everyone convicted under it. John Marshall issued a decision upholding the Sedition Act. It wasn't his role as a Supreme Court justice, but it was him. If we take the position that the Supreme Court's final, then Jefferson was wrong. He should have been impeached. Each branch takes an oath to the Constitution, and I want you guys to think about that for a minute. The Constitution, I'll show you the text, does not say the Supreme Court's supreme. They said it in Cooper, right? They said it. Okay, follow it or not, people in Arkansas didn't quite follow it. And many times since, the court has reaffirmed Cooper. But when there's no one opposing the court, it doesn't really make a difference, right? When the court issues these rulings, everyone says, yeah, let's go along with this, right? Big deal. But when the court issues these rulings and people oppose it, that shows at once how impotent the court's can be. Danny? Uh, am I misunderstanding this here, but they're going off the 14th Amendment to set up this judicial supremacy. So are they only speaking to the state legislators, executives, and in judicial branches wherein they can't go against what the court said while leaving open the possibility that the federal executive and legislator can still disagree? I'm sorry, I missed your question in the middle. I'm sorry, I lost it. I lost the train in the middle. Can you repeat it, please? No, it, it's just that they're basing it off of the 14th Amendment uh -huh. and then going into Article 6. And then later, the, the, next, the next paragraph after it says, no state legislator or executive is with the office of the against the Constitution without violating his undertaking to support it. I guess my understanding when you're talking about this is that they're really directing it towards state legislators and everybody not being able to go against what the court said and not specifically against the federal legislator or executive branch. Is that a misunderstanding of it? So, Denny, let me, let me answer your question with this, right? Under the Supremacy Clause, who's bound by the Constitution? Well, everybody. No, no. Read okay. it. Read it. Uh, in the judges in every state shall be bound. Does it mention the state executive and legislative branch officials? 
So if you go, I didn't put it up there, but the next paragraph of Article 6, um, the, two par the, the next paragraph of Article 6, so someone call it the page. Okay? The judges in every state are bound by this free will of the land. Representatives and executive officials are only bound to support this constitution. The framers created different duties for state judges and state legislators. What that duty is, we can argue about, but there's different duties. State judges are under a higher burden. I don't think state executive and legislative officials are bound by the Supreme Court's rulings. It doesn't say it in the Constitution. Now, Cooper said it here. They said it, but the text. Uh, I'm going to have to move on to, to, to Loving in a minute. But if you want, I recently wrote an article called The Irrepressible Myth of Cooper v. Aaron, which is where a lot of this is coming from. So I'm very amped up on this today. Uh, you can read if you want. It goes through the drafting history of this case. But we haven't went to Loving. We have like 10 minutes left. But come up afterwards and be happy to answer those questions. But Cooper was a decision that announced supremacy. It was not Marbury. Um, that, that much we can say with certainty. OK, uh, who's next? Cameron, are they calling you ready? Uh, you next? Yes. All right, you want to give us the facts of Loving, please? So we have Mr. Richard Loving and Ms. Mildred Eater. Uh, they wished to get married, but it was outlawed in Virginia, considering Richard was white and Mildred was black. So they went to Washington, D.C. and got married. Uh, they came back to Virginia, and they were eventually invited and arrested, uh, sentenced to one year prison sentence, or to be very for 25 years, I believe. Um, they said it violated their 14th Amendment due process, or equal protection. And, um, and then we had the case from the Chief Justice Warren, who gives the opinion of the court, saying that this is ridiculous. Social relation is to a state power, but the 14th Amendment is to the state. OK, thank you. Um, did anyone see the movie The Loving? Yeah. Oh, I don't have time to play the clip. Uh, if you, you know, play it, no, play after class if you want. Uh, but it's an excellent movie. Um, I usually don't like movies, but the Supreme Court is usually terrible. This one was actually good. One objection that drove me nuts. Across the street from the Supreme Court is the Capitol. Okay? They have a scene of the Lovings driving up to the Supreme Court, and they show like residential houses across the street from the court. Mm, drove me nuts. But other than that, it's a good movie. That, everything else was good. A, a wonderful movie. Very, very well cast, very well played, but that one scene drove me crazy. Um, this was a very um, important case. You had an interracial couple, right? Richard Loving and Mildred Jeter. And the movie's very good. It shows them very delicate. It, it gets a relationship very well. Uh, they were not allowed to get married in Virginia. So they went to the District of Columbia, which is right next door, and they got married there. Um, they brought them back to Virginia. The movie depicts a scene. It's very troubling. Um, in the middle of the night, they basically break down their door with dogs, and they arrest them. At this point, Mildred was several months pregnant, and they throw them in jail for the weekend. They, they deliberately did this on a Friday, so they couldn't be arraigned until Monday. They let Richard out on bail pretty quick, but they held Mildred, who was pregnant, in a jail cell by herself for the entire weekend until Monday morning. Um, they were indicted on violating the Racial Integrity Act, I think it was 1924, check me on the year, which prohibited po a white person and colored person from cohabiting and marrying or ma marrying somewhere else. Um, there's a note about this in the book, but the Racial Integrity Act was passed under the same provision as the eugenics law at issue in Buck v. Bell. Um, and you have to look at these things as two in one, right? Eugenics was about cleansing the species of improper breeding. And one way of doing this was to prevent interracial marriage. And another way was to sterilize imbeciles. These were viewed as two parts of the same um, agenda. At some point, the Lovings came back to Virginia. I told you they got arrested. They were thrown in jail. And the judge sentenced them to jail. But he suspended the sentence if they would leave the state for 25 years and not return. Okay? They did not appeal this judgment. They just fled to D.C. 
Now, as I'm sure you know, when you don't appeal within a certain amount of time, generally, you waive the right. And there's a scene in the movie, I don't have time to play for you today, but Mildred and, and uh, Richard are sitting in a lawyer's office, right? And they weren't sophisticated, they weren't lawyers. The lawyer said, so we need to challenge your conviction. I'm like, okay. But we can't challenge this unless you get arrested. So he said, how about you guys go back to Virginia and get arrested so we can challenge your conviction? <laughs> the look on there, like, are you insane? You want me to go and get arrested, throw him back in jail? So they found a way to challenge it to set aside the conviction. And they knew they were going to lose in state trial court. And they knew they were going to lose in the state Supreme Court, right? Their only hope was to get this up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And that's exactly what happened. Um, the Virginia Supreme Court upheld the conviction. And they said that these laws are reasonable for supporting the racial integrity of its citizens and preventing the corruption of the blood. This is Buck v. Bell style language. Um, and this gets to the Supreme Court. Now, the movie depicts this well. It doesn't come up in the case. But the reason why the government argued to the Supreme Court they needed this ban, ready for this? To prevent interracial children from having a stigma of being raised by an interracial family. They said that if a child is in a mixed race family, he will have certain problems, and the state wants to protect that child from existing by preventing the breeding in the first place. Uh, if you if you go to the uh, movie, and I'll play it for you later if you want, but if you watch the movie, this comes out. Uh, the lawyer actually says this with a straight face. It's, it's a remarkable argument that they make it. Okay? Okay, Kendall, what does Chief Justice Warren do with this conviction with respect to equal protection? Um, he feels that he didn't, what is it, reasonable? Yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Kendall. Doesn't the statute apply equally? Black people can't marry white yes. people, and white people can't marry black. Isn't this an equal protection of the law? That's the state's argument. But okay. It's saying that it's ridiculous because it's only talking about white people marrying. Blacks can't marry white, that's just the same. But it doesn't talk about any of this. It, it says white and colored. Is that, what other races are there? <laughs> I'm being facetious. I'm being facetious deliberately. Yeah, but, but yeah, so, so Kendall's right. The government comes in and says, this law is equal protection. That applies equally to white people and people who are not white. Right? That is people of color, you would perhaps say today. Um, the court says that this racial classification doesn't work. And this is what came to be known as scrutiny. We'll talk about this more a lot next week. I don't want to mention it more than in passing now. But when you have racial classifications, the courts are very skeptical of them. They say that the reason you're giving us protecting children of interracial marriages, right, protecting the blood, those are not the real reasons. And when you hit strict scrutiny, the courts can then look behind the law and try to, to figure out the real reason for it. And Chief Justice Warren says it, this is an endorsement of the doctrine of white supremacy. He says it flat out without any equivocations, that you're throwing someone in jail because they married someone of the opposite race. So the equal protection argument is actually fairly straightforward, that there's no good reason, there's really no reason at all to criminalize. Again, this wasn't whether they get married in Virginia. This is about criminalizing them for marrying outside of the state and returning to Virginia. It's an important point people don't remember, right? The state had no valid interest to convict this. All right, so everyone okay with equal protection analysis? Raven. Part two of the opinion focuses on the due, oops, sorry. Part two focuses on the due process clause. Okay. What's the court's analysis here? It says that based on the previous jury, whoever, and it's not the state's decision, Okay, very good. So the court looks at the due process clause, right? And they say that one of the liberty interests, which of course long recognized, is marriage. Right? And because marriage is one of the basic civil rights of man, 
it is fundamental to our very existence and survival. Okay? Um, this language is uh, uh, quite significant um, because it will be cited decades later in the same-sex marriage litigation. I just mentioned it briefly to note that the reason why the court back then said marriage was essential to our survival, they were talking about reproduction. Uh, that's what they were talking about. But we'll, we'll get back to there later. And the court says that to deny this fundamental freedom on so unsupportable basis as racial classifications and by these statutes is to deprive all citizens of liberty without due process of law. So again, you have, like in Brown, an equal protection component and a substantive due process component. Both of them are combined in the same opinion. And they both lead to the same result, that this criminalization of what's called miscegenation, it's a big word that means interracial marriage, miscegenation, was a violation of the 14th Amendment. Okay. Questions? Yeah, JC. Doesn't the equal application analysis pretty much destroy Plessy? Yeah, did they even mention Plessy here? No, they did not. No, they did not. They should. It, it would be an opera, they, but they didn't overturn it. All right, let me play this clip real quick for you. About two minutes, I'll let you go. Uh, Yeah, go loving. All right, thank you all very much. <laughs>